I don't say that it's the only right translation. I say it's the best. And uh, I make no apology for that. And what a travesty that whole denominations have put that NIV in their church pews. It's, it's a corruption. Now, I don't know. You check me out. I had a guy call me the other day, and he said, Les, do you know that the NIV is almost, not quite, almost identical with the Jehovah's Witness Bible? I said, well, I wouldn't doubt it, because I got no time for either one. But uh, that's just another sign of the times. Why this? Be In fact, while, while we're waiting for things to settle down, let me just read. Here's one of the new versions that came out a few years ago, and it's called The Message. How many of you heard of that one? Yeah, a lot of preachers are using it. They better wake up, because one of the co-editors of the message a few years later came out with his own version, which he named the Renover Bible. Now, you'll see that in the bookstores, too. All right, now, this editor of the Renover Bible, who worked hand in glove with the people who brought out the message Bible, put this in his Bible, in the Renover. Now, listen to this. The explanatory notes of the Renover Bible deny the divine authorship of much of Scripture, denies that Moses wrote the Pentateuch, or the first five books, yet they hypocritically declare, now I'm quoting, we read the Bible literally from cover to cover and in context. Renover claims that Genesis 1 through 11, the first 11 chapters, is neither historic nor scientific, and that the entire book of Genesis is merely a collection of myths. Now, do you hear that? Now, this is what they put in the Renover. Genesis began as an oral tradition of narrative stories passed down from generation to generation. These stories gradually took on theological meaning. Over time, they were written down and collected together, and a prologue was added borrowing from other creation accounts, that is, from other cultures and so forth, borrowing from other creation accounts, stories with parallels to ancient Near Eastern religious narrative and mythology were reshaped with monotheistic intent, and these strands of varied materials were gathered and edited into the written texts, which we call the Old Testament. Now listen, that's the kind of guys that are putting out these Bibles that people are swallowing hook, line, and sinker. Be careful. Okay, turn with me first before we go any further to 2 Timothy 2.15. 2 Timothy 2.15. It's one of my benchmark scripture references because... It's the whole basis of everything that I teach, from cover to cover, from Genesis 1-1 to the last verse of Revelation. You all got it? Study. Now think a minute. What's the difference between read and study? Big difference. You read something and it's just, did you close your Bible? Well, I've had my devotion today. When you study, you compare Scripture with Scripture. And I think if anything has made my ministry what it is, it's, that's the way I handle Scripture. Compare Scripture with Scripture. Not what I think, but what does this verse lined up with this verse really tell us? All right, so that's the difference between reading the Word and studying it. So you study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, that word in the Greek, rightly dividing, is also literally translated to cut straight. And I was in a Baptist church down in Florida in February, and uh, it was the monthly supper and Bible study of the adult Bible class of that church. And so had out all the potluck material. And when I got up to speak, 
Off to the left of me was the pie table. And it just struck me like a bowl of light. And there sat that beautiful pumpkin pie with one slice took out of it, taken out of it. All right, the lights came on. That is the perfect picture now of rightly dividing the scripture because instead of cutting that pie in nice, clean cuts, which, of course, pumpkin pie is the best explanation, you make a nice, clean cut of however many slices you want a good, and everybody gets a clear-cut piece of pie. What if you set the pie on the table and put a spatula in the middle and said, okay, help yourself? That wouldn't seem like pumpkin pie, would it? Would it? No. That'd be a bunch of a goo on your plate. All right, that's what they've done with the book. Instead of slicing it cleanly and clearly and understandably, it's just like when I've always otherwise used the blenderizing of it. They, they, they just gobble it out at you and it doesn't make sense. And then they ridicule our dispensational approach. That's what they do. They ridicule it. They, they just detest it. You know why they detest it? Because it's the only thing that makes sense. They don't want you to make sense of Scripture. They want you to listen to what they say. But you rightly divide the Scripture and you separate, like I already read to you, who wrote it, to whom was it written, what does it mean, what are the circumstances. That's rightly dividing the Scripture, see? All right. Now, rightly dividing the Scriptures then cannot be done unless you approach Scripture dispensationally. Now back up with me to uh, Ephesians. To the left. Come back to Ephesians. Chapter 3, verse 2. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 2. Now, some people claim to be dispensational, but they're really only halfway. They only take enough dispensationalism to satisfy a certain part of their curiosity, but yet they're not ready to take all of it because it throws a curve at maybe their denomination or their traditions or what have you. But even though I was raised a Baptist, you all know that. My gosh, I was bred and conceived a Baptist, and I was a Baptist deacon for 20 years. Listen, I twisted more people's arms into that tank than you can shake a stick at. I was a master. I used all those verses on baptism. Now, I'll tell you up front, I didn't intend to do it this early in the day because I didn't want to lose half of you this early. But see, I was already questioning the whole bit because of experiences that I was having. One of which was, now bear with me, because I think these things should tell you people something. It was after, of course, we'd been on television a few years, and uh, we had a small group of people out in Washington State who had been using our videotapes for a weekly Bible study. And out of that little weekly Bible study, 18 or 20 of them decided to reopen a little old country church. Now, this is clear up in Washington State, north of Spokane, next to the Canadian border, on the west side of the Columbia River. Boondocks, just pine trees everywhere. So they called one day and wanted to know if there would be any chance that I would come out and spend three or four days with them when they were ready to reopen that little country church. They'd gone to a lot of trouble, put in central heat and air, and it looked like a little country schoolhouse. And... Uh, they had gone through all the cemetery deeds and everything and got all the cemetery and everything back on track with the state. So I said, yeah, we'll, we'll come out because we had already scheduled a seminar in Denver. So Iris and I left Denver and we drove all the way out there to Spokane. Well, anyway, we got there on a Wednesday evening and the first thing that happened, a lady came up in tears and she said, Les, she said, pray for my husband, Bill. She said, when he was in Vietnam... He knew that if anything happened, he was going to hell. So he went into the chaplain. And the first thing that chaplain caught on was, he said, young man, you don't know anything about the Bible, do you? He said, no, that's why I'm here. Well, he said, then I can't help you. Kicked him out in so many words. 
So now he's in Vietnam, so what do you suppose he turns to? Buddhism. So he embraced Buddhism and was still practicing Buddhism now when we were out there. And so tearfully she said, just pray that God will open his eyes. She said, nobody can touch him. He is so convinced with Buddhism and got turned off by Christianity. So, okay, this is Wednesday night. Thursday afternoon, Thursday night, Friday afternoon, Friday night. I think we had sessions on Saturday. One of the times he was ready to come along with her, and his best friend stopped by and needed help with something. And so she said, isn't it funny how the devil can work? And so he went with his friends. So she did, still didn't get it. But Sunday morning, Sunday morning, he came with his wife, and they sat on the front row. It was a little church with two aisles like this. And he was sat right there. And he hung on every word, just soaked it up. So I went right on into the morning service hour, brought out the plan of salvation as clearly as I knew how. And the pastor came in. It was a little Baptist, uh, Baptist church. And the pastor came in and gave an invitation, which is all right. But the guy didn't make a move. All right, but after church, and it was a hot day. It was about 90-some degrees. I mean, it was hot. And we stood out there in that churchyard, and I said, Bill, I know that for the last two hours you have been soaking up every word I've been teaching. He said, yeah, I have. Aren't you ready to just come away from your religion and put your trust in the gospel? He thought a minute, and he says, yeah, I am. I said, are you willing to just tell the Lord in my hearing that you now believe that he died for you and he rose from the dead? He said, yeah, I said, I can do that. And so right there in that hot sun, he just asked the Lord to save him because he believed. I just about lost it. But here comes that Baptist preacher. Now, Les, did you tell him he has to be baptized? Wow. Lord, give me grace. <laughs> I said, look, preacher, that's got nothing to, nothing to do with it. Oh, he says, it's got to be. Now, let me ask you something. How many people have you baptized over your 25 or 30 years of preaching? How many have you baptized that you now know were never saved in the first place, percentage-wise? Well, he says, over half. I said, over 500% were never saved and you baptized. Yeah, I said, I guess so. I said, well, in baseball, that's a pretty good batting average, isn't it? You baseball guys, my Ted Williams only went to 400. I, in other words, half the people you baptized were never saved in the first place, so it didn't do a nickel's worth of good, did it? Well, no, I guess not. I said, so don't talk baptism to this man. It has nothing to do with his salvation. If down the road, that's what the Lord leads him to. Well, but, beloved, it has nothing to do with salvation. Okay, a couple years later, my mom passed away up here in Iowa. And I've been out of Oklahoma a while. So I wrote her obituary. And here's what it was. When she was 17, she came to know the Lord and was saved. But she didn't follow the Lord, as we say in Baptist circles, until she was 27 when she and dad were baptized and joined our old Baptist church together. Well, that's the way I had it in her obituary. So after the funeral, and we're sitting down in the kitchen having coffee, and the then pastor, who I didn't know, he came up and introduced himself, and he said, Les, did you write your mother's obituary? I said, yeah, I did. Why? He said, I loved it. An obituary? <laughs> he said, I loved it. Why? is the way you separated her baptism from her salvation by 10 years. And I said, so? Now listen. He said, now Les, you know these old Baptists better than I do. You grew up with them. That's right. Don't you know that 99% of them, when you pressure them, that baptism is part of their salvation? you got to be kidding me. We always emphasize, even when I would twist their arms, I would always emphasize, this has nothing to do with salvation. This is just 
you know how we've always put it. This is just a, an outward show of an inward so and all is all the baloney. And I said, I can't believe that. No, sir. He said, when you really push them and how you know that you're saved, if you die tonight, will you go to heaven? That baptism is part of it. And beloved, that's when I backed away from it. I won't condemn you if you want to be baptized, but I will never again encourage it. Some of the most ungodly men of Oklahoma came to know the Lord and became the greatest testimonies far more than any 50 Southern Baptists in the area, and they never had a drop of water. So now that's my take on baptism. I took it. If you want to, fine. But there is not one verse in Paul's epistles that recommend or demand water baptism for salvation or, now this will shake up a few of you Baptists, there is not one inkling in here that it's necessary for church membership. You cannot find it. Now, forgive me, I got another example. I had a young man who was going through Northeastern University up in Tahlequah where I had a Monday night class. All through four years of his undergraduate work, he was there every Monday night. Super young guy. Well, then he went into optometry school with the same university, so I had him another two or three years, every Monday night. Well, when he graduated from optometry school, he went down to southwestern Oklahoma, to Lawton, next door to Fort Sale, and uh, got involved with a local Baptist church, and in short order, because he has now become a real student, he knew the word rightly divided, he knew the grace message, as we call it, and it wasn't long, and they made him deacon, wasn't much longer, and he became the chairman of the deacons, and he was instrumental in getting that large congregation to take away the requirement of water baptism for membership. Took it out of their constitution, and what do you suppose the Southern Baptists did? Kicked them out. Unceremoniously kicked them out. Well, there was another church in Oklahoma City that had done the same thing, but the last I heard, they had kind of chickened out, and they hadn't really gone through with it yet because they didn't like to raise the ire of the denomination. But anyhow, this young man down in Lawton then called me or told me about it, and he said, I'm going to write a letter to the denomination, and when I get the answer, he said, I'll either send you a copy or I'll call you. All right, now these are all things that just build to where I'm at. You know what that denomination had wrote back? Two-page letter, but not one verse of Scripture. And what was the closing statement? So the reason we do it is because it's Baptist tradition. Now, beloved, tradition is one of the meanest words in this book. Paul over and over says, beware of tradition. Because tradition is not scriptural, unless it's scriptural. And so here's where we have to analyze these things because I was in a Baptist church down in Florida. He's under the same kind of a situation. The denomination would love to kick him out. But he's sitting there. He's just continuing to preach it exactly the way I do. And when he invited me, he said, Les, I agree with you 1,000%. He said, you don't have to apologize for anything you've said on television in my church. Well, we were having dinner after the morning service, and uh, I said, Brother Ted, I said, how are you handling water baptism? He smiled a little bit, and he said, well, two years ago we were going to have a baptismal service, and the tank was leaking so bad we couldn't have it. And he said, we haven't fixed it yet. <laughs> now, I'm not going to ridicule you for your baptism. Don't get me wrong. But what I am emphasizing, you and I as Baptists and all these other denominations have been sold a bill of goods that's not in here. That's all I'm saying. It's not in here. Consequently, oh, okay, let's look at this in a minute first since I got on that. I didn't intend to do that. Not until late this afternoon. <laughs> First Corinthians. Chapter 1, and listen, this was just as hard for me to swallow it is maybe some of you. But what are you going to go by? You're going to go by tradition, or are you going to stand on the Word of God? 
Because, beloved, one day, even as believers, we're going to stand before the Bema seat, the judgment seat of Christ, and we're going to give answer to these things. We are going to answer how we accorded ourselves with Scripture. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And remember now, Paul is in a whole different game plan once he starts his epistles from even his work in the book of Acts. That's why I'm always emphasizing don't use Acts for doctrine because it's transitional and a lot of things are still practiced in the book of Acts that Paul would never teach in his epistles. So always remember that. He took a Jewish vow, went to the temple in Jerusalem. He baptized the Philippian jailer. He baptized Lydia. But now look what he says in his letter to the Corinthian church. Chapter 1, verse 12. Because, see, Paul was always having to defend his apostleship. So when you wonder why people look at you cross-eyed when you stand on Paul's teaching, don't think for a minute you're alone. He had problems from day one. They thought he was an imposter, even though he was the one that brought him out of paganism. It was his preaching of the gospel that brought him out as far as they were, and yet they turned against him. All right, so this is what he's dealing with in this letter. Verse 12, Now I say that every one of you saith, I am of Paul. Others said, Oh, I'm of Apollos. And others said, No, I follow Peter. And still others said, I don't mean any of those. I follow Christ. Yeah, I hear those too. Bless, I'm not going to follow Paul. I'm going to follow Jesus. Oh, you are. Well, you know what? Jesus never once taught salvation on death, burial, and resurrection. He couldn't. Hadn't happened yet. So if you're going to follow the teachings of Jesus, I feel for you. You're not going to get very far in eternity because you've got to come the way the scriptures un unfold it. All right, so here's where he had the problem. So is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? Now look at that next verse. I thank God that I baptized none of you. Then he has a second thought. Now, Holy Spirit inspired. Don't forget that. This is all as it's supposed to be. I thank God I baptized none of you, but Crispus and Gaius, and lest any should say that I had baptized in my own name. I baptized also the house of Stephanus, and besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. How much importance is he putting on baptism? None. None. It doesn't count anymore, see? All right, now read on. Verse 17. Here's the reason, and that's why I'm saying what I'm saying. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to do what? Preach the gospel. Now, I told the old man he didn't have to bring the whiteboard up, so I'm, I'm taking him off the hook. But if I had the whiteboard up here, I would give you a lesson in theology that a young Lutheran theology, theologian's daughter gave me one time, way back when I was still in Iowa, and I had a class out at the University of South Dakota for faculty people and uh, upper graduates. And we met in the student union every Friday night, I think it was, for one whole semester. And I had 45 or 50 of those professionals. And we pretty much went through the scriptures. So on the last Friday night, I was going to be there, and school was going to be out next week. I had a lady come up, introduced herself. I, I'd seen her out in, in the class, but I never got acquainted with her. But she was a professor's wife, and she came up and she said, Les, she said, I've enjoyed this immensely, but uh, she said, the way you like to use the board, can I use it a minute? I said, yeah, go ahead. So she grabbed her chalk. Now I wish I had my board. <laughs> Follow me. She put a dot down here in the left-hand corner. Nice big dot. She said, here's where I was born, physically. She brings her line over about an inch or two, another dot. Here's where I was baptized. Now, Lutheran, remember, a Lutheran theologian's daughter, married to a college professor. Here's where I was baptized. I became a child of God. Okay. 
Now she said, I come up. She dropped 45 degree angle. Now I'm coming up through my childhood years. I go into catechism. Goes a little further. Now I'm 14 and I'm confirmed. And I become a member of the Lutheran Church. Now she said, I'm on my way to heaven. But she said, should I have sinned some awful sin or turn my back on all this, then I would have fallen out and I'd be a candidate for what you're preaching. Now, beloved, what is that? That's Lutheran theology. Pure and simple. Right? Don't come up and clobber me all at once. That's Lutheran theology. You're born, you're infant baptized, you become a child of God, you take on off on your Christian life so-called, you get catechized and confirmed and memorized and you're on your way. Hell bound as anybody can be until they come to a real knowledge of salvation by the gospel. Now that's not all. We were in a Lutheran church in Minneapolis and uh, I had had some trepidation. But we hadn't been with the pastor five minutes and he gave me his testimony. How when he was 20 years old, he came to know the Lord. Well, that gave me a certain degree of comfort. And within 15 minutes, his wife came into the picture and she started telling about her. And she too wasn't even saved until she... Neither one of them mentioned what I just talked about. Neither one of them mentioned infant baptism or catechism. They both had come to a knowledge of salvation. Perfectly comfortable. I got no problem with that. Well, then, lo and behold, a day or two later, we got talking about some of these things that I didn't think a Lutheran had anything to do with. And he says, you know, we were up in northern Minnesota on a fishing trip, myself and a bunch of my church men. And he said, we were out on the dock on a beautiful early morning, ready to go in the boats and go out and fishing. And he said, one of my men explained, Pastor, wouldn't this be a glorious place to be raptured from? And I about fell over, and I said, now, wait a minute. You believe in the rapture, too? Oh, he says, always have. So you see, you've got these exceptions in any group. But by and large, when you talk to the run-of-the-mill Protestant, this is the format. Now, I'll give you another illustration. Just to back up what I'm saying, I had a wheat farmer from western Oklahoma call here probably last year. And he was all shook up. And he said, Les, I just got back from the funeral of one of my fellow neighbors and a fellow church member. And he said, I was at the funeral, and the casket is down in front of the pastor. And he said, he held up his baptismal certificate, and he said, Beloved, our brother is in heaven because of this. He said, I'm going to write the denomination. I said, yeah, go ahead. When you get the answer, let me know. So he wrote to the head of the denomination and said what this pastor had said concerning that deceased individual that that baptismal certificate is what put him in heaven. Did they refute it? Nope. They never commended him for what he did, but they did not say that he was wrong. So you see, this is what exercises me. Listen, millions of these dear people are going out to a lost eternity because they've swallowed the wrong thing. And I'm going to do my best. That's why up in Minnesota, I can have a seminar of seven, 800 people, and half the people that come up will say, less thanks to you, I'm an ex-Catholic or I'm an ex-Lutheran, because that's 90% of the population. But you see, that's not me. God is opening hearts to the simplicity of the gospel. All right, back to 1 Corinthians now then. So Christ sent me not to baptize, Paul writes, but to preach the gospel not with wisdom of words, not with a bunch of high and philosophy and theology, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. Just like I gave the illustration a little bit ago. Paul says, I am not going to slap baptism onto that perfect work of the cross. Nor anything else. All right? Verse 18, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Now, I'll bet most of you, if you have shared what you know now from what you've learned from me, you're shunned, aren't you? 
Yeah, I see heads nodding all over. You're shunned. They, they, wait a minute. You know, you're falling for a bunch of... They don't want to hear the truth. They're comfortable. And there again, I had, a, had another couple from another denomination came in strictly by bizarre circumstances. He had been an elder in his denomination for years. And they both got saved. All right, they go back to their church people now with this simple gospel. Would they buy it? No way. The lady said, Les, all they're telling us is we're comfortable. Leave us alone. Oh, it's, un it, it, it's unbelievable. All right, but the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us who are saved it. The preaching of the cross is what? The power of God. See, and that's why our letters constantly emphasize, lest you've changed my life. No, I didn't change it. My message did. And it will automatically change lifestyles. I know I've got people here today. You can say the same thing. The things that you once thought you couldn't live without, you wouldn't be caught dead doing now. And I didn't tell you what you could do or couldn't do. The Spirit does that. It's a whole new life. Well, anyway, now I got off track on dispensational. I promised the guy I was going to be talking about. It. All right, so what did Paul mean when he says, rightly divide the Scriptures? Now then, forgive me for sidetracking, but come back to Ephesians 3, verse 2. Ephesians 3, verse 2. Y'all got it? Now I'm going to have to tell you what I did with an MD. He was dispensational. He believed in the rapture and the tribulation, but he never considered the fact that Paul had a unique ministry compared to the 12 and so forth. Never had that at all. So I'm trying to show him this dispensational aspect of rightly dividing the scriptures. So he was sitting at our old kitchen table. I mean, it's getting kind of tacky. I'll have to admit, the dogs have chewed at a couple places, and I sometimes think, in fact, I told somebody the other day, you know, I said, isn't that we can't afford it? I, I said, we really should get a new kitchen table. And the guy says, no way. There's too much history on this one. So if you come and visit us, you're going to see that our kitchen table is nothing fancy. It's just a plain old round oak that my mom inherited from her mom and so forth. But it does. It has a lot of history. All right. He was sitting at my kitchen table, and I was having him read verse 2. Now, he's an MD. Oh, he's not a dummy. And he read, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God was given me to you, word, and he said, I don't see what you're driving at. I said, shoot, you didn't even read it. Read it again. Well, brrr. Doc, read it. Third time. He said, I don't see what you're getting at. I said, read it like a sixth grader would read it. One word at a time. Well, he did. And then what? The light came on. Ah, oh, he's not ever saw this before. You mean that everything in this dispensation of grace has to come from Paul? You better believe it, beloved. You better believe it. Because, see, now let me explain a dispensation. It's that period of time in human history during which God lays out a particular set of directions. Now, let's go back to the Garden of Eden, the simplest dispensation in Scripture. It was a dispensation. It was a period of time from creation until the fall. All right. In that period of time that they're in the garden, what was their set of directions so far as having a relationship with their Creator? What was the direction of that tree you shall not eat. Period. That's all. Everything else was for them to enjoy. But don't eat of that tree. 
That was a dispensation. It was a period of time, and God gave out a set of directions, which was singular in this case, but it was a dispensation. Oh, right, when did it end? When Adam and Eve failed it. They didn't follow the directions. They goofed it. Out they go. That ended that dispensation, see? All right, now you got a couple others, but now the next one that's easiest is the dispensation of law. How did God give Israel the law? Through one man. Who was it? Moses. Do you ever see anything else in the directions concerning Judaism and the law from anybody but Moses? Never. Never. The law came strictly by Moses. And when the Lord had his earthly ministry and they tried to corner him, what did he tell those Pharisees? You have Moses. See? What was the reason? Because that's the way God does it. And so he gave the, dis the, the, the uh, directions for the dispensation of law, which of course was multiplied compared to ours, but it was still a set of directions that the Jew had to follow if they were going to stay in God's good graces. But did they? No. The Messiah came. We'll hopefully look at that a little more in detail. And they presented himself, and instead of believing who he was and following him as their Messiah, what did they do? They rejected him and they crucified him. So they ended that particular dispensation under the law. And God doesn't open up the next one, of course, until he gets to the next individual that he's going to use, which is Paul of, or Saul of Tarsus. All right, so now then, to be particular and not be slap happy, you take all of your directions for this dispensation of grace from this apostle. All the rest of Scripture is still appropriate. Of course it is. It's all the Word of God, beloved. But when it comes to the distinct directions for our relationship with God today, it comes from Romans through Philemon. Now, when this guy started preaching that believers are going to witness the great white throne, all I would have to say is, now you go through Romans through Philemon. Can you find that in Paul's epistles? Well, of course not. Well, then it's false. If somebody would have come along and put something into the law that Moses didn't put there, it would have been false. See? But, oh, we let people get away with, they don't like Paul, a lot of them. Now, I haven't heard it so much lately. Maybe I'm getting through to people. But my, from the time I first got to Oklahoma until about a year ago, I was hearing it constantly. We don't have a thing to do with Paul. My preacher will never preach from Paul. My Sunday school teacher says Paul shouldn't even be in our Bible. On our G and Cruz, I had a guy come up and tell me, boy, Les, he said, you're right. These people are on the footsteps of Paul Cruz, but they hate his message. How would you find out? He says, I was talking to a few of them. He, they don't want a thing to do with it. Okay, this is Christendom's problem. They want to be able to take what Jesus said and what Peter said and what John said, and they want to blenderize the whole thing and leave Paul in the background if possible. Beloved, it ain't going to fly. All right, here's why. Here we go. Paul's apostleship. Go all the way back now. Isaiah. I mean, we're going to go all the way back. Isaiah. Chapter 2. Now, this is, like I said earlier, 700 years before Christ. I could have even gone back to 2 Samuel, I guess. <clears throat> when David was promised that through his lineage would come a king. That's really where it really begins. But by the time we get to Isaiah, which is uh, about 300 years after King David, the prophets now are not laying out a dispensation of law. The prophets are laying out what 
the nation of Israel can look forward to as a result of their being obedient to their dispensation. That's what the whole purpose of the temple worship everything, was to prepare the nation for the coming of their Messiah and this glorious earthly kingdom. Which again, how many of you in the mainline denominations ever heard of an earthly kingdom until I came along? You don't ever hear it. Why? Because it's end time prophecy. They don't have anything to do with that. And so I'm not the only one that teaches like this. Don't ever let me impart that idea. My, there are thousands of them out there. I think the Lord has just blessed me with maybe making it a little plainer than a lot of them do. He's given me a, a format. My goodness, who would have ever dreamed that this ministry would be where it is? I didn't. But I'm not alone. Don't ever think for a minute that this is just Les Feldick's idea. My, there are greater men than I that teach it the same way. They may disagree or I a little bit. But basically what we're showing is that from the onset of the nation of Israel, they were being prepared for a glorious earthly kingdom over which God the Son would rule and reign. That's the kingdom of heaven that everything is being prophesied forward to. All right, Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2. Now this is prophecy by a Jewish prophet to the nation of Israel. It shall come to pass in the last days, see, when things are ready to wind down and bring in the thousand-year reign of Christ. It shall come to pass the last days that the mountain, which is a, a reference to a kingdom, that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the tops of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills. In other words, it's going to be a kingdom superior to anything that has ever been on the planet. It will be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow into it. Now, don't just read that and forget what you read. Here is coming a kingdom with the capital city, Jerusalem. God the Son is going to sit on David's throne, and he's not only going to be ruling the nation of Israel, but it's going to be a worldwide kingdom. Satan is gone. There is no sin, no death. It's going to be glorious, a beautiful earth. And it will be the kingdom of heaven on earth. That's why it's called the kingdom of heaven. It will be heaven on earth. Now this was Israel's future all the way up through the Old Testament. This is what the prophets are warning that before that glorious kingdom comes, God's going to have to punish them. They're going to be overrun by one empire after another. But the final fruition is the king will come and establish this heaven on earth, and Israel will be the epitome of the nations. All right, verse 3. Many people shall go in and say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways. We will walk in his paths for out of Zion. Now, Mount Zion's in Jerusalem. And out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He, for, verse 4, he, this coming Messiah, shall judge or rule among the nations. See? He'll rebuke many people. And then here is going to be the result of his establishing this glorious kingdom. They will beat their swords into plowshares. From war and confusion, it'll be to food production like you wouldn't believe. Turning their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war... What's it going to be? Heaven on earth. Now that's the prospect laying in front of Israel all the way up through the Old Testament. All right. The Messiah comes. See? Now come back up with me to Matthew. The Messiah comes. And drop in at Matthew chapter 5. 4. Just a minute. Got to look. Chapter 5, verse 17. 
Now, just this is Jesus speaking at the beginning of his three years. Matthew 5, 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Well, now, the first casual reader of this will think he's looking at the cross. No, he's not looking at the cross as yet. What's he coming to fulfill? These Old Testament kingdom promises that he is the king and he's ready to usher in this glorious earthly kingdom. Satan removed and sin and death obliterated and it would be heaven on earth. That's what he came to fulfill. Okay? Verse 18. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle in no wise shall pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. That's the purpose, was to prepare Israel to be the evangelism force in the midst of an unbelieving world, and they could all become priests and evangelists under the headship of the Messiah and King. Now, always remember, this is merely an offer, and they never got it because they rejected it in unbelief. But here was their prospect, see, that every Jew would be a priest of Jehovah. Now, I'm probably fouling up your thinking more than helping today. Forgive me. You've you got to remember, I, I'm sick of the dog. I'm amazed that I'm getting along as good as I am. Exodus, chapter 19. Keep your hand in Matthew. I'm coming right back. Exodus chapter 19. They're just fresh out of Egypt. They're gathered around Mount Sinai. And God is speaking to Moses up there in the mountain. Exodus 19. Drop back to verse 5. All got it? Exodus 19, verse 5. And remember, get the picture. Israel is encamped around Mount Sinai out there in the desert. God has come down to meet with Moses in the mountain. And look what he says. Now, therefore, if you, the nation, will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, the covenant or the dispensation of law that will soon be ushered in in chapter 20. And if you will keep my covenant, then you shall be... Now watch these words carefully because I'm going to jump right up to 1 Peter when we finish here, and I want you to see how all that fits. If you will indeed keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people... The Jews are going to be head and shoulders above every other race and nation of people. And God says, I can do that because the earth is mine. I'm sovereign. It's mine. I can do what I want. All right, now verse 6. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of what? Priests. Now, what does that mean? That when Christ would establish his throne in Jerusalem, Every Jew was going to be a priest, a go-between between all these Gentiles and Israel's Messiah. That was the prospective role. You shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, a holy or a set-apart nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak to the children of Israel. Now, you got the picture? This was Israel's prospect. Now, when you get to the book of Isaiah, it says as plain as day that Israel was to be a light of the Gentile. All right, now turn all the way up. Keep your hand in Matthew. I'm coming back in a minute. And go all the way up to 1 Peter. Peter, not Paul. Paul doesn't say anything like this. Paul never calls us priests. Paul never promises a ruling and reigning kingdom. We're members of the body of Christ over which he's the head. A big, big difference. But Peter, 
He's still associated with Exodus. He's still associated with Israel. All right, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Now, I hope you got enough memory that you just remember reading in Exodus. What were the words? Almost identical. Almost identical. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. You have to go back to Exodus? I'll read it for you. And you'll be a treasure unto me above all people. You shall be unto me a kingdom of priests. You will be a holy nation, a peculiar treasure. Isn't that amazing? Well, what's Peter looking for? The soon return of Christ, as soon as they've gone through the tribulation. And then all these Old Testament promises would become a reality, see? But they had no idea it was going to be interrupted by the church age. All right, so now then come back to Christ's earthly ministry, and he's presenting himself as the fulfillment of all these Old Testament promises. All right, now that brings up another point. Sorry, back to baptism. Why in the world did John the Baptist demand water baptism from these Jews? Well, every Jew was to become a what? And what was every priest have to do before he could become a priest? Wash, wash, Leviticus 8. Wash, 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 like a surgeon getting ready for surgery. Every Jew was to go through a a uh, ceremony of washing because he's going to be a priest. All right, now let's go one step further. When the Lord Jesus Christ came in his earthly ministry, he came to fulfill three roles. What are they? Prophet, priest, and king. Now, if he's going to be a priest, what does he need? A ceremonial washing. So what did he demand? John baptized me that I have completed the ceremonial washing for my priesthood. That's all. He didn't have any sin to be washed away. All right, so there comes the whole complex reason for all of this baptizing in Israel's economy. It depicted a preparation for a priesthood. You see that? Okay, now come on over to chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. Now, I know that must be hard taking notes the way I teach. I, I, I beg your forgiveness, but hopefully when you get home, you can make sense out of it. All right, so all the way up through the Old Testament now, we've got this promise of a glorious kingdom and a Messiah, a Redeemer, but all promised to the nation of Israel. Nothing to do with the Gentile world until God has Israel in place first. So, verse 35 of Matthew 9. Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the grace of God. Is that what it said? No, it's not what it said. Preaching the gospel of the what? The kingdom. Now, if you want to compare Scripture, keep your hand in Matthew. Come back to Acts, chapter 20, verse 24. No, 20. I'm sorry. 20, 24. I goofed. Yeah, 20, 24. Acts 20, 24. Now, just for sake of comparison, now we're in Paul's ministry, or toward the end of it, really. And look what it says. None of these things move me, neither count I my life dear to myself. Now, you know, he has suffered exorably for 25, 26 years for the sake of the gospel. I count not my life dear to myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. You know how happy the man was? Now, this is, of course, according to the legend. They were taking him out to be beheaded on the Appian Way. And 
The executioner was evidently standing there next to the block with his axe in hand. And the story goes that when Paul saw it, he broke from his Roman guard and ran to the block and laid his head on it. And I can see that. That's what he means. He had run his course with joy. He was ready to let the Romans exterminate him if they want to. He had done what he could do. How many of us would be like that? How many of us can actually look at an executioner and say, I'm ready. I've done all that I can do. Not many of us. You know, I'm sometimes alarmed. I, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. How many of you have been a Christian for years and years and you've never won one person to the Lord? That's most. Don't feel bad. That's most. We just don't do it. But you see, this man was so filled with a desire to do God's bidding that the executioner's axe had no fear for him. All right? So he said, I ran my life, uh, my course with joy and the ministry which I have received with the Lord Jesus to testify or to proclaim the gospel of the what? The grace of God. And then these preachers get on my case. Oh, they get on my case. Because I'm telling you, there were two Gospels at this time. Not today. No, there are not two Gospels today. There's one. But during the transition, while God was still waiting for Israel to finally pull the plug on their scenario, yes, Jesus and the Twelve preached the Gospel of the Kingdom. The good news of this glorious earthly kingdom because the King was in their midst. But see, God knowing that Israel was going to reject it and reject it and reject it, now in the book of Acts raises up this other apostle. There's the answer to my question. Why Paul? Because Israel rejects it and everything. So now God's going to do something totally different. He's going to turn to the Gentile world, not with Israel and their priesthood. He's going to turn to the Gentile world with this other one apostle to whom he is given now then the dispensation of the grace of God like Moses got the dispensation of the law of God. Now is that so hard to comprehend? Two total economies maybe for 15 or 20 years, that's all. The Jewish economy falls through the cracks. Israel is going to lose the temple. That's another thought. Have you ever realized how completely in control God is with everything? that he did not allow the Romans to destroy that temple in Jerusalem until Paul had finished his ministry. That just dawned on me just a few months ago. Now, that wasn't an accident. Those Romans had been occupying Jerusalem for 100 years, and they hated the Jews, and yet they could not do anything until God says, okay, we don't need the temple anymore. We're no longer going to be under Jewish law. We're going to be under Paul's gospel of grace. Take it away. And they did. Now, that's the amazing thing of Scripture, see? And you've got to learn to rightly divide. We're not under Jesus' teaching ministry. That was Israel. We're not under the things of the book of Revelation. That's future Israel. We're on that segment in between. And our New Testament is set up exactly that way. The four gospels, all Jewish. The book of Acts, 90% still Jewish. Paul's epistles. And then when the church age is over, we come back to that which is still left. Peter, James, John, Jude, Revelation. Just exactly according to the timeline. And these preachers can't see it. Not all. I'm not condemning the whole clergy. But, oh, you, you have no idea. You have no idea how they get on my case. And you know what I write back? I said, the only reason you can't see it is you don't want to. And they don't. They don't want to see it because then they got to. Now, have I got time? Yeah. I do get encouraged. Oh, I get encouraged. Two years ago. So I know it's been since I was here last unless I shared it in August. I don't think I did. Two years ago. The week just before we were ready to go to Minnesota for our, our time up there, I got a phone call on a Saturday morning, introduced himself as, all I remember was Bill, from Charlotte, North Carolina. 
And he said, Les, I had to talk to you personally because he said, I am so excited. He said, I just have to check and see if I've got this right. He said, I'm 71 years old. He said, I'm a retired Episcopalian priest. He said, I was driving across Charlotte the other day or sometime back on my way to visit my mother in the nursing home. Now, he says, I never listen to anybody on radio or TV, never. But he said, you came on, and I reached to turn the dial, but accidentally I turned the volume up. <laughs> and he said, in 30 seconds, he said, I was hooked. And he said, I listened to you all the way to the nursing home. And he said, by that time, I was so exercised. He said, I went in and spent a few minutes with my mom. And I said, Mom, I got to get back home. And he said, when I got back home, he says, I found your stuff on the Internet. Now, Les, he said, for the last three months, I think it was, he said, from early in the morning until late at night, I am studying your stuff on the Internet. Now, he said, here's my question. How in the world did I experience all that education? I was an Episcopalian priest for 40 years, and I missed all this. I said, well, how much have you missed? He started back in Genesis, the whole thing. <laughs> and he had it down perfect, beloved, perfect. He didn't miss an inch of it. Now he says, here's my question. Will God ever forgive me for misleading all those people for 40 years? And I said, well, Bill, thank God that he is a forgiving God. Yes, he'll forgive you. Well, he says, will he give me time to undo some of the damage? I said, that I don't know. <laughs> well, you know, I get up to Minnesota two, three days later, and I'm ready to open the home Bible study, and one of the fellows in the home Bible study is the owner of several of the stations that carry my program. And he's less before you start your teaching. He says, I've got to share something with everybody. He said, last week, he said, I had an Episcopalian priest here in Minnesota went to all the trouble of going through the FCC in Washington to find my personal home number so he could get a hold of me personally. And all he wanted to tell me was, don't ever take Les Feldick off your radio. Well, he says, why? What, what's your reason? And then he went through the same thing of everything that he had learned from my teaching on radio. So two Episcopalian priests in one week. Oh, a year ago, I get another phone call on a Saturday morning, and the guy says, I'm calling on Saturday because I wanted to be sure I could talk to you. Mm -hmm. I said, all right, what's up? Well, now, Les, he said, I am a retired Baptist pastor. I, I think it was in Virginia or one of the East Coast states. He said, I have two earned PhDs in theology from two different seminaries. I have been pastoring Baptist churches for 40 years almost identical with these priests. And he said, when I retired 12 months ago, one of my boys bought me a satellite. And he said, the first day I had it, I caught your program. And he says, I got hooked. And he says, I watched every day program. I studied your stuff off the Internet. Now, he says, here's my question. How did I have all that education and preached for 40 years, and I missed it all. Now, I know what I'm talking about. This is exactly where they are. Last week, I had the same thing from a Pentecostal guy in Texas, 40 years old. He said, Les, I've never seen this before. He said, the first thing I did was call my younger brother in Dallas. Hey, get into this. We have been fed a false bill of goods. And listen, this is what encourages me. This is for real. When the Holy Spirit opens their understanding, it's not what I do. I'm not fast-talking anybody into anything. All I'm saying is, what does the book say? All right, so now then, you know, go 15 minutes till break time. Now come across the page to chapter 10 in Matthew, and here we have the ongoing now of the fulfilling of these Old Testament promises that Israel is going to have a glorious king and a kingdom. But now remember, nobody was involved with these Old Testament covenants except Israel. 
There's no Gentile involvement whatsoever. It's Jew only. And so this is why Jesus now makes the statements that he does. Matthew 10, most of you have heard this before. Verse 5, these 12, Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, now watch that word commanded. These were his orders. And he commanded them, saying, go not into the way of the Gentiles. Don't you go to any Roman city. Don't you go to any other city. Don't you go to a Gentile. And even the Samaritans enter you not because they were half-breed Jews. Now verse 6. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now do you need a degree in theology to understand that? Don't go to Gentiles. You go to Israel. They are the covenant people. Whether they're up in Galilee or whether they're in Jerusalem, you go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And don't you go to Gentile. All right, I guess I got time. Turn over to Matthew chapter, oh, let's see, 15. And I have to use these things because... I realize that most people, because I've been there, they have never been shown these distinct differences between our dispensation of grace and the dispensation of law. Because law was getting Israel ready for the kingdom to be evangelists. And the law was a tutor. That's what Paul says in Galatians. The law was our schoolmaster to prepare us for that which was coming. Okay, so now then, here we have another scenario. Verse 21. Then Jesus went from thence and departed into the borders of Tyre and Sidon. Now, Tyre and Sidon, beloved, were Roman cities, seaports on the Mediterranean sea coast. But he doesn't go into the city. He stays at the border. And that's crucial. He does not go into Tyre and Sidon. All right, so he went and departed to the borders of Tyre and Sidon, and behold, a woman, a woman of Canaan came out of, see? She comes out of the city limits of Tyre and Sidon, and she cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a demon. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, is there? A logical request. But he answered her, Not a word. And his disciples, the twelve, came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. She's a nuisance. She's a Gentile. We don't have anything to do with Gentile. All right, verse 24. But he answered and said, I am not sent but or except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, I heard a radio preacher myself make this statement. Well, you've got to realize that Jesus was still bigoted here. He didn't understand his role as for the whole human race, John 3.16. That's the stupidity that you can get. He was the creator. He's the author of this book. And he was too dumb to know the difference between a Samaritan and a Gentile and a Jew? Baloney. Okay. I am not sent, but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she comes back and worshiped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It's not right to take children's bread and cast it to the dogs. I can't take that which belongs to the children of Israel. They're the covenant people. I can't give it to you, a Gentile. All right, but then she comes back and, of course, gave the good excuse. Dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. And so he condescends. Sure he does. He heals the daughter at that very same hour. All right. Now, when you come across, since you're right here anyway, chapter 16 again, Matthew 16, here is the gospel of the kingdom. This is the gospel of the kingdom. This is what Peter gained salvation by. Matthew 16. Start at verse 13. 
And when Jesus came, now this is the end of his three years. They'll be in short order going up to Jerusalem and the crucifixion. <coughs> when Jesus came into the borders of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? In other words, he says to the twelve, Who do the rank and file, today they use the expression, on the street? Who do the people on the street think I am? Well, look at their answer. After three years of miracles, well, some say you're John the Baptist. Some think you're Elijah. Others think you're Jeremiah, one of the prophets. And he said unto them, But whom do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered. Now here is Peter's confession of faith in this gospel of the kingdom. Now before I even read it, I'm going to ask you to re uh, consider any reference to the cross? Any reference to any shed blood? No. It hasn't been time to reveal that yet. That's still kept secret in the mind of God. So Peter's confession of faith is strictly who Jesus Christ was. Thou art the Christ. See, the Messiah. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Period. And was Jesus satisfied? Next verse. Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, flesh and blood hasn't revealed it unto thee, but my Father who is in heaven. Now today, of course, it would be the Holy Spirit's work. But Peter's heart was open to understand, this is the Messiah. This is the one the prophets have been talking about. And that's all God asks. That's the gospel of the kingdom. Okay, now you move on through. I got five more minutes. I still got a lot more, but I'll run out of time if I'm not careful. Now come over to Acts chapter 9, 7. Acts chapter 7. We've come all the way through Pentecost. And yes, thousands were converted on the day of Pentecost, but what's that out of several million? Just a drop in the bucket. Just the few. But most of Israel is rejecting it more and more. The further you get away from Christ's ministry, the more unbelief becomes evident, and they're rejecting it and rejecting it and rejecting it. Okay, so the final appeal to the nation of Israel is Stephen, not one of the twelve, in chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. All right, you can read this in your spare time. He goes through all of Israel's history to show again that this Messiah was the promised of the prophets. And so now then he hits these Pharisees and these religious leaders right between the eyes. Verse 51. You stiff-necked, uncircumcised, can't you hear him? You think I get rough. <laughs> you uncircumcised, stiff-necked, you do always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers back in the Old Testament days as they resisted, so do you. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted and they have slain or killed them who showed or prophesied the coming of the just one. Who is he talking about? Well, the prophets. When the prophets proclaim this coming Messiah and that Israel's glory was yet to come, they didn't like the message, so they killed the messenger. Jeremiah, they hadn't quite succeeded in executing yet, so when the Babylonians came in in 600 B.C., where did they find Jeremiah? Down in a dungeon. Well, why was he down in the dungeon? The Jews didn't like his prophecy. And it was typical of them, see? All right, so Stephen is laying it on him. You haven't changed a bit. Your forefathers killed the prophets. You killed the coming Messiah. Boy, now that's putting him on a guilt trip, wasn't it? All right. So which of the fathers, verse 52, have not your fathers persecuted, and they have killed those who showed before the coming of the just one? of whom you have now been betrayers and murderers. That's what he's telling the Pharisees and so forth. You who have received the law by the dispensation of angels, and you've not kept it, 
All right, so then they, you know what happens. They end up stoning him. And now you jump up to verse 58. They cast him out of the city, stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. Now, stop and think. For seven years, as near as I can determine, for seven years, the twelve have been laboring in the area of Jerusalem to Jew only. No hint of going to the Gentile. But what are the Jews doing with their kingdom message? Rejecting it and rejecting it. And they epitomized it when they killed Stephen. We'll not have anything to do with this Jesus of Nazareth. All right, so now what does God have to do? He introduces the next player on the stage of history. And who is it? Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus. You know, I rehearsed some of these things, maybe too often, but several years ago, Richard Land, who whether you're a Baptist or not, you'll see his name in the headlines quite often. He's a liaison between the convention and the United States government. And uh, tremendous individual. Uh, I've heard him preach once or twice, and uh, I think a lot of him if he hasn't lost it. But he was uh, a guest speaker in one of the churches where Iris and I were visiting one Sunday morning. And he was going to preach from Ephesians chapter 3. So he said, now while you're looking up Ephesians chapter 3, he says, I want to make a statement. Of all the men who have ever lived on this planet, not counting the Lord Jesus Christ, of all the men from the dawn of history until the present, there has never been a man like the Apostle Paul. Now you think about it. There has never been a man like the Apostle Paul. Well, it wasn't six months later and one of the major news magazines had their lead cover article on men who had changed the direction of history. Who'd they put as number one? The Apostle Paul. I couldn't believe it. They actually had the wherewithal to give the credit to the right guy. Because you see, Paul alone, like I said a little while ago, no big entourage going out ahead of him, maybe three or four of his friends, walked into these pagan cities with no fanfare, and just simply started preaching the gospel of the grace of God. And those pagans bought into it. The book of Acts says he turned the then known world upside down. Why? Bringing them out of paganism to this trusting that work of the cross without any fanfare. It's unbelievable. And he did that for 25 years casting everything of his good lifestyle to the wind and did nothing but serve the crucified, risen Christ. And then he's castigated and hated by much of Christendom. Now, I think this might be a good time. I got one minute according to my watch. I got two according to that one up there. Go back to 2 Corinthians, if you will, chapter 11. Because I want you to see this. This is what this man did to see those pagan Gentiles saved. There's not a one of us in this room that would even come close. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Like I said earlier, he always had to defend his apostleship. They detested him then, even as they do now. And before the guy was even put to death, what did he write to Timothy concerning the churches in Asia Minor, which was where most of his work had been accomplished, which is present-day Turkey, what had all the believers in Asia already done before he was killed? Turned against him. Not against the man so much, but his message. Why? Human beings think they have to do something. And they detest the message. You don't do anything. You just recognize that you're a hellbound sinner and you believe that when Christ died, was buried, and rose from the dead, he satisfied everything that God could demand and all he wants you to do is believe it. 
I got a fellow sitting back there when he was asked one time, and they said, have you ever taken Jesus as your personal Savior? And he says, no. He said, I never took him as my personal Savior. I believe that he died for me and rose from the dead, and the first thing I know, he became my personal Savior. Hey, I love that. That's the right order. You don't do anything. You believe what's been done. And when you believe what's been done, things are going to happen. That's my life. Heck, I was nothing. All I did one night coming out of Hot Springs, Arkansas, Iris and I had been married nine months, and I was getting discharged, and she was still working, and we were heading up to Iowa to start farming. And as I drove down off West Mountain, all I said, Lord, my life is in your hands. I want to farm. I've been a farmer since I was three years old. I'd like to farm. But on the other hand, I want to do what you want me to do. That's all I said. Nothing fantastic. Three weeks later, we're up in the church in Iowa, and they got a bunch of kids that nobody can handle. So the preacher asked me if I'd start teaching them. That was the beginning of it. That's all I've ever done. Nothing. But just let God do it. You know, I, I, I make a point of the fact. I do not go anywhere. I have never yet done anything in the Lord's work without the door opening first. I have never had to take the prerogative. That's why I will not ask for a dollar of money. I have never to this day. And when people write and say, Les, if you ever get in a bind, call me. No, I won't do that. I just will not do it. All right, but now here's what Paul went through for that you and I can sit here and revel in this glorious gospel of the grace of God with no strings attached. Starting at verse 22. Now remember the reason for his writing this. He's writing to the Gentile church at Corinth who are turning their back on him and they are rejecting his authority as an apostle. They're saying, oh, we can buy Peter, we can buy Apollos, and that, but who are you? All right, here's the Holy Spirit's answer. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. See, now those are all titles of the Jew. Are they ministers of Christ? Now he lets his humility come in. He said, I speak as a fool. I am, what's the next word? More. I am more the ministers of Christ than those 12 men ever hoped to be. Now stop and think. How much did those 12 disciples suffer other than their martyrdom? Not much. They didn't have much of a ministry after Christ left the scene. Yes, they all died a martyr's death except maybe John. But did they go out and just beat their heads against all the... No, not that we have any record of. But look what this man went through. And not for just a year or two, for 25 or more. In labor, more abundant. Absolutely. My he turned the then known world upside down single-handedly. In stripes above measure, constantly under the whip of the jailer. In prisons, more frequent. In deaths, plural, he was near death, time after time. Of the Jews, I received the 40 stripes, save one. That's the 39 out of the cat of nine tails. You know what that's like. One beating, and they were like hamburger. And he went through five of them from the Jews. I don't know how many others he went through from the Gentile. Three times he was beaten with rods. You know, whenever I read that, I have to think of those poor little American boys over in Hong Kong a few years ago. You remember that? When they came under drugs or something and they gave them beating with cane rods and all oh, the media just went wild. Barbarian. Hey, this man went through how many of them? Three of them. Once he was stoned up in Lystra, you remember, and they dragged him out like a dead animal. Three times I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I've been in the ocean in the deep. In journeyings often, in peril of water, peril of robbers, peril of his countrymen, peril of heathen, peril of the city, peril of the wilderness, peril of the sea, perils of false brethren, weariness and painfulness and watchings often, not just for a year or two, 
for 20 some years. Over and over and over and never gave up. I, I, I can't comprehend it. And then, besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care or the concern for all his little churches. My, you know, I want to see the Lord Jesus first of all, absolutely. I want to see my old dad. I want to see Paul. 